All right, guys, take your Bibles. 2 Corinthians chapter 9. Back to 2 Corinthians chapter 9. And this is the second chapter about giving financially, okay? We already, if you remember last week, we spoke about the need to give to a needy people. You know, if our brethren, if there are churches that are in serious need, in serious help, things outside of their control, things like famines or whatever, then God's people ought to get together and put a donation and help them out financially, you know, if at all possible. And we saw it doesn't take a church to necessarily be that rich. You know, uh, Paul explained that the churches in Macedonia were very poor, and yet they were able to give very uh, liberally, very abundantly out of their poverty and out of their uh, persecution as well. Okay, so we're moving on to this uh, ch uh, next chapter about giving, and uh, I'll get you to look at verse number 6 there, 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 6. The Bible reads, But this I say, He which soweth sparingly shall reap also sparingly, and he which soweth bountifully shall reap also bountifully. Okay? So the title of the sermon this morning is, He which soweth. He which soweth. And this is definitely speaking about sowing financially. You know, last night, just in preparation for this uh, sermon, just to get me pumped up a little bit, I went to YouTube and had a look at some televangelists. You know, and oh, I forgot the guy's name. Something Tilly. Does anyone know who that is? Something Tilly. He's, he's back from the 80s or the 90s. He's pretty... Robert Tilly, yeah. He's pretty much washed up now. But uh, I was just watching him go in, you know, uh, behind, the, you know, in the telecast saying, you know, the Lord wants you to give $1,000. And, and he says, you know, well, he says to the, to the person, you know, obviously watching that, oh, why couldn't you say $25? He goes, no, $1,000. I know you've got $1,000 to give. And um, look, the context of giving, the context of this verse is to give to people that are needy, okay? Not to some televangelist that was bringing in $10 million a year at his peak. That's not the context of this verse. And he was using this verse in chapter number 6 of sowing the seed. If you sow $1,000, then God's going to give you riches. God's going to give you wealth. Okay? And so we're going to be talking about that a little bit, but obviously talking about, you know, what, what, the, what the biblical teaching really is. Okay? So um, let's start with verse number 1. And you might be saying, Kevin, why, why are you preaching about giving money? Is it because we've got a building? No, it's just, we're up to 2 Corinthians chapter 8 and 9, you know. That's just the way God saw fit, you know, to, for us to get to this topic. Maybe, you know, so we can be taught how to give. And what we see in, definitely in chapter 9 versus uh, chapter 8, chapter 9 deals with how we ought to give. What your heart condition ought to be like when you give, okay? So let's look at verse number 1, 2 Corinthians chapter 9 verse 1. Paul says, for as touching the ministry to the saints, obviously the giving of the saints, the, the donation that they're giving to the churches in Judea, he says, it is superfluous for me to write to you. Okay? Now that word superfluous means it is unnecessary. Okay? He says, look, I, I shouldn't have to really write any more about you giving to the saints. He has already, you know, obviously written about it in chapter number 8. So it says, really, it is, it is unnecessary for me to, to write further about this, but yet he does write more about this. Look at verse number 2. He goes, why is it unnecessary for me to write about it? In verse number 2, he goes, for I know the forwardness of your mind. And if you remember, the Corinthian church were being forward mentally. They were willing to give of themselves financially, and they had started a collection, but they never got around to finishing it. They never got around to sending these, this financial gift to the church in Judea. So Paul is saying, look, I shouldn't have to really write. It's unnecessary for me to write more because I know you're willing to do this. Okay? And we know Paul in the previous chapter was adding a little bit of pressure on the church. Hey, you know, make sure you give because even the church in Macedonia who was so poor and under persecution had given very much. So you who were abounding in, 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 in all things, he said, you should be willing to give of your finances as well. And so he was putting a bit of pressure on the church, but obviously he knew that the church was willing. He knew the church had already started this collection. Okay? He goes, For I know, the, in verse number two, for I know the forwardness of your mind, for which I boast of you. <laughs> Again, he's saying, Look, I've been boasting of you 
of Macedonia. <coughs> and look at this, that Achaia, and that's where the, the Corinth church is based, that Achaia was ready a year ago, and your zeal have provoked very many. Now, I don't know if you picked up there what, what, what Paul is saying there. He goes, when I went to Macedonia, I told the churches there that you guys, the Corinthian church, you guys were zealous. You wanted to give abundantly of your wealth. You know, and then he goes, and your zeal have provoked very many. So we saw in the previous chapter, chapter 8, that Paul is telling the Corinthian church how the, how the churches in Macedonia had given abundantly to get them encouraged, to get them motivated to give. But then how did he get the Macedonian church to give? He said, because you, you know, you were going to give bountifully. I told them that you, even though you were, you know, you had, you, we, we all know you had a lot of problems. We know you were, you, you know, you, as a church, you know, you weren't the greatest church out there. You had a lot of things to fix. But even in your state, you were going to give a lot. You were going to give a lot to this, to this task. So the church in Macedonia were like, oh, man, if they can do it, surely we can. You know? And now he's saying, and now he's trying to get the, you know, the Corinthian church to go, well, look, Macedonia could do it. Surely you can. Okay? So their zeal, and look, again, Paul wasn't lying. Okay? Paul's not, not lying about them. Obviously, they started the collection. He knows that. He knows they were willing to do this. Okay? Uh, but they just hadn't finished doing it. So it's, it's just interesting. It's kind of ironic that he uses the, the zeal of the Corinthian church to give, to get the Macedonians to get encouraged and motivated to give. You know, and now he's using the example of the Macedonian church to get the Corinthian church to, fi to finalize that offering. Okay? And I, I think the point I just want to drive here is, don't underestimate, even though we're a, we're a young church, even though we're a small church, don't underestimate our ability to influence other churches. You know, don't underestimate, you know, the fact that we're meeting weekly, the fact that we're going out soul winning, you know, the fact that we, 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 uh, we preach the Bible without compromise. You know, we put our sermons online. There are, there are I, I wish I had the numbers, but there are a lot of people watching us online. About 66% of the sermons that get watched are from Australia. The other 44% are from, from overseas, in other countries. You know, from New Zealand, America, you know, Europe, Africa, Asia. People all around the world are watching our sermons and are being encouraged. And so don't underestimate our influence, okay? We should always be mindful. Yes, we're encouraging, we're edifying one another, but other churches are watching us. Other churches are curious, and, and hopefully we can encourage other churches to, to be more zealous for the Lord, more zealous for the Word of God, more zealous for soul winning, okay? And maybe if we're ever lacking in that area, we can look at other churches and go, look, look what they're doing. Look at the great works they're doing. Okay, it's not a competition, but it's about encouraging one another, okay? Verse number three. Yet have I sent the brethren, lest our boasting of you should be in vain in this behalf, that as I said, ye may be ready. Okay? So the brethren that Paul is sending, if you remember the previous chapter, was Titus and another brother that was respected and well known by the other churches. And Paul had said that he was very diligent. He was very diligent with finances. He was going to go and help Titus you know, make sure that these, this money was collected. Remember back then, they didn't have bank transfer. They couldn't just F-post things across or, you know, go on net bank and transfer money. You know, obviously they were collecting uh, uh, coins. And so it took, you know, uh, the effort to carry it and to count it and to keep a, a good uh, account of, of all that donation. So um, he says, look, because of the boasting, you know, I've sent these brethren ahead of, ahead of my, my uh, visit to you so they can get this uh, donation finalized. Now, why did he send Titus and his fellow brother before he arrives? Well, he answers this in verse number four. He says, lest happily, now that word happily is not happily, that word happily means by chance. Okay, it's an old word by chance. He goes, just in case or by chance, if they of Macedonia come with me, so just in case there are brethren in Macedonia that come with me in my journey to come and visit you and find you unprepared, find that you haven't given of your finances, he says, we, that we say not ye, should be ashamed 
in this same confident boasting. So it's because I boasted of you that you were willing to give of your finances and that's what drove the Macedonian church to give. If, if by chance, you know, we, I get some helpers from Macedonia to come and visit you, it's going to be, I'll be ashamed, I'll be embarrassed that you haven't yet given of your finances, that you've not yet given, uh, you know, of, of, your, of your abundance. And it says there in verse 4, we, and then in brackets, that, that we say not ye, it's kind of like the idea of how we say um, um, not to mention you. So, yeah, I'll be embarrassed, but not to mention you. <laughs> okay? You also will be embarrassed. Okay? It'll, it'll be a shameful thing. It'll give the church a bad reputation that we've boasted about your financial giving and you've not accomplished that. Okay? Now, I guess the, the thought I want to say here is, Again, just, just keep in mind, you might say, well, you know, maybe, maybe Paul shouldn't have been boasting about this church. Maybe Paul, maybe that, look, uh, potentially that could have been a mistake of Paul. Potentially, as a man, it could have been his mistake. But again, Paul knew that they were willing to do this. Paul knew that they had started this donation. And so he was greatly encouraged. Remember, he heard from Titus a great report that this church had improved. Okay? Now, I think the lesson that we should take from this and I'll just quickly read to you from Matthew 5.37, just very quickly, words of Jesus. He says, But let your communication be yea, yea, nay, nay. For whatsoever is more than these cometh of evil. I think the point I want to drive home, especially as a church, and we can apply this as individuals, is that we ought to be a people or we ought to be a church of our word. Okay? If we say we're going to do something, we better accomplish it. All right? And if you think, if you have doubts as to whether you can accomplish it, just be nay-nay. It's better to just say, no, I don't think I can do that, and then achieve it, rather than say, yes, I'll do that, and not achieve it. Okay? It brings a bad reputation. You know? If I were to say something, if I were to make foolish comments like, man, we're going to be the, the biggest IFB church in Australia, and then it never comes into fruition. That, doesn't that look embarrassing? Isn't that a shameful thing? You know, or, or to just be boastful about things that I don't know of. You know, when, and the Bible tells us that when we speak about future things, we should say if the Lord is willing. You know, and quite often we apply this. You know, I'll, I'll say to sometimes the guys in Sydney, you know, Lord willing, I'll be there unless Christina gives birth, you know, this coming week. Things like that. You know, you want to be people. And I, I need to be careful about this. Because I find that just in my own personal life, I sometimes commit to things and then I realize I can't actually accomplish that. And um, I, I was once told that by my last employer that I had, he goes, Kevin, you take too much on board. Like we, we ask, Are you, can you do this? And you're like, yeah, yeah, I can do that. And then you find that you know, you've got too much on your plate and you can't get it done. Obviously, I'm willing to do it. Obviously, I want to accomplish those things, but I haven't sat down and thought about um, you know, am I really able to fit this in into my schedule of my day? Am I really able to put some, of, some other project, you know, um, on, on the back burner and, and get this job done, you know, in time? So be, be, be mindful, you know, about yourself, you know, as, as to the things that you commit to. And, uh, I mean, even the question about, you know, can we let people know about our new church building? Well, I, I would love to, but I'd rather wait for the, for the documentation to come I would rather wait for me to sign that lease and then say, yep, it's ours, we've got it, you know, before we start to let everybody else know. Because again, imagine if that doesn't come into fruition, we've let all these people know that we've got this new building coming. It's going to look embarrassing, it's going to look shameful. So we, we just need to be mindful that when we boast, you know, we boast in the Lord, but that we say yay, yay of the things we definitely know. You know, if we're not sure, we can say, well, Lord willing, or if we're just definitely not sure, just say no. No, we can't do that, okay? Um, I think that's a lesson that we can take out of this. Otherwise, it's embarrassing for us as a church. Uh, in this case, it'd be embarrassing for Paul, right? If the Macedonians that were poor come and see a richer church not having given their finances, and that's what drove them to give abundantly from themselves, you know? So um, let's just be mindful of that as a church. Let's go to verse number five. Verse number five. Uh, Therefore I thought it necessary to exhort the brethren that they would go before unto you to make up beforehand your bounty whereof ye had noticed before 
that the same might be ready as a, mount, uh, as a matter of bounty and not as of covetousness. So he goes, this is why I thought it necessary to send before you know, uh, Titus and that fellow brethren just to get it all done, to give you enough time to finish this donation um, so that um, beforehand, just so to save any kind of embarrassment. Okay? So he's trying to, you can see that he's not trying to um, embarrass the church. He's not trying to criticize the church. You know, he's just trying to give them ample time to finish this task that they had already committed to, that they had already started. And what we're going to see here from verse number five, what we see change here is not so much that they ought to give, they know they ought to give, but, you know, how to give. You know, and, and that's, that, these are the points that I want to uh, go through uh, with you guys just through this. And I, I know the context is not about our tithes, our, our, you know, our weekly tithes and offerings that we give to the church, to the daily running of the church. I know the context is not about that, but I do believe we can take these principles and apply that to any financial giving, okay, including our, our tithes and offerings. Okay, now he says that the same, look at there in verse number five, that the same might be ready. So the reason why he sends Titus beforehand is that the same might be ready. Okay, point number one about financial, giving financially is be prepared to give. Okay, be prepared to give. When you come to church, okay, and you know that it's time, you know, you know the Lord has, has blessed you financially, it's your time to give to the church, be prepared to do that. Don't leave it as a last minute like, you know, offering. Or, because here's the thing, if you leave it to the last minute, more often than not, you're probably going to forget. Okay? Just be prepared. Make it a, a, a habit to, to have your finances ready to give. You know that our preference is to give, um, you know, cash, right? Um, and at some point, again, I haven't rushed into this. We're going to have a church bank account. And then you can give, um, obviously, via direct deposit or what have you. But, you know, just have a mindset to be prepared to give. Again, Paul had given this church ample time to prepare themselves to give and not make it a last-minute uh, issue for them. Um, and, you know, this will become vital, guys, especially with our new building, um, because obviously with the new building, we're going to be paying twice as much just to meet, just to have a roof over our heads compared to what we're paying now. So obviously when, when we're paying twice as much, and we need to pay this, this amount every month, it's going to become important, especially as me, some of that council money and pays for things, to know, you know a rough idea that this is how much is coming in per week, that I'll know by the end of this month we should have this much, and I'll be able to, you know, be, be able to give that and pay that to the landlord. Okay? Because otherwise we might go through some months, if we've not prepared ourselves, we might go through some months that are very uh, poor, and then um, I might have to give, you know, just out of my own pocket kind of thing to make up the cost. But then the next month might be plenteous, okay? But it's just much easier if we're all prepared to give, we give consistently, then it's easier for me to know, okay, this is how much is coming in. By the end of the month, we'll be able to pay that next month in advance and so on and so forth. The next thing I want you to notice there at the end of verse number five, he goes, uh, that, that the same might be ready as a man, matter of bounty, and not as of covetousness, okay? Because if he gave the church like a last minute, all right, give up yourselves, you know, this is the last chance, it might drive the sin of covetousness in the hearts of the members there. They'll be like, oh, look, there's not ample time. I would rather just hold on to my money myself, and it, it could drive that. So that's why it's, it's important um, uh, to give. Actually, that wasn't the point that I wanted to make. But anyway, that, that's the point. The reason why he's given them enough time is that they would be prepared and not leave it as a, as a last minute thing because if you leave it as a last minute given, covetousness might come up in your heart and go, well, you know, I actually need this for this week. But if you had prepared, you'd be fine. You, you'd know this amount would be to the church and the rest that I have in my paycheck, whatever, would be for my family and all my other bills that I, that I have to give, okay? But the point that I wanted to make, sorry, the second point I wanted to make, so point number one was pre be prepared to give the second point I want to say is to give generously and give or give liberally. Okay, we, we see in the Bible that word liberally is give generously. So when he says that as a matter of bounty, okay, that word bounty, I know we, we probably think of bounty, we think of pirates and we think of pirates' treasures. We often call that the bounty, you know, they call that bounty. 
Uh, but really the word bounty means generous, being generous. And it's kind of like the Spanish word, I don't know if you guys know this word, Spanish word, bueno, means good. Okay, it means good. It's kind of this idea, it's the same kind of root word, but it just means uh, give generously, give liberally. Okay, so again, Paul is giving them that ample time so they can give generously and not be tight with their giving, not to become greedy or covetous in their hearts as they give to the church. And you know, you know I, I've, um, the way I, I've always given to church, and I'm not saying this just because you know, I'm now the pastor of a church, but just throughout my whole life, I've always been mindful, I give my, I've always been mindful just to give my tithe. I never thought about it, I just, I just separated it, I put it into the church bank account, or I gave it to the church offering, and I never thought about where that money goes. And obviously the churches that I've been part of have always given sort of a breakdown, this is how much we spent on this, this is how much we spent on that, but I never really cared, because I would often find certain members getting upset with how the money was spent. Oh, we should have given it to this missionary instead of that missionary. We should have done this instead of that. And I realized, you know, once I give to the Lord, I felt like I've done my task for the Lord. And if the church misused those funds, then, the church, then God will come on that, that leadership, whoever was made that decision, you know. So I've, I've always just been the type to, to pay it. I'm the type to just, as soon as I get a bill, I know sometimes you've got 15 days or something to pay. I just pay it. I don't care. You know, I remember when I first moved here, I wasn't aware of all the traffic, uh, sorry, of all the speed cameras, and I got a, like a $160 speeding fine, you know, and I was like, ah, oh, so frustrating, right? But I, I, just, I just pay it and I don't care about it anymore. Just pay it, I don't care, right? And I just like to get those things out of my mind so I'm not, like, I'm not there thinking about the, those finances. And the other, thing, the, the other good thing about paying your bills or paying your ties and just getting that out of the way is because then you're left, what you're left with, you know that is honestly what you can spend with your money. All right, so uh, anyway, point number two was to give generously or give liberally. Let's go to verse number six. Verse number six. But this I say, he which soweth sparingly shall reap also sparingly, and he which soweth bountifully shall reap also bountifully. So the principle here is kind of like farming, okay? Obviously, if a farmer wants more crops, what does he have to do? He has to sow more, okay? If he wants a greater produce, he has to sow more seed than he had before, okay? He has to till the ground, he has to work the ground, sow that seed, because what if he doesn't do any sowing? Is he going to reap? No. Okay, we can apply this to numerous things in our life. If you want to see souls saved, guess what? You're going to have to sow the word. You're going to go out there and knock doors and preach the gospel if you want to see souls saved in your life. Okay? If you want to know the Bible more, if you want to reap more Bible knowledge, what are you going to have to do? You're going to have to do more Bible reading. You're going to have to sow to your Bible reading. You're going to have to sow to Bible study. You're going to sow to attend church and other ways that you can learn from the Word of God. I mean, this is just a matter of principle. Okay? If you need a higher income, you need to work more hours. Or you need to apply for a job that's going to be paying you more. Okay? You need to sow. This is just a, a, a general concept in life. You want a better marriage? You've got to sow to that marriage to reap you know, a, a, better, a better marriage, a better relationship with your wife, a better relationship with your kids. You know, this is a, a basic principle, but again, we're applying this to finances. Okay? So he's saying to this church, look, Again, the idea of giving generously, the more you give, the more you're going to reap, okay? The more God is able to bless you, okay? Now, this reminds me, if you guys, let's see, where can I get you to turn? I'll get you guys to turn to Luke 21, and we won't turn there straight, we won't read there straight away, but I'll just, while you're turning there, I'm going to read to you from Luke chapter 6, verse 38. This isn't the only time this, this uh, principle is taught. Luke 6, 38 says, give and it shall be given unto you, good measure, pressed down, and shaken together, and running over. Shall men give into your bosom? For with the same measure that ye meet with all, it shall be measured to you again. Okay? So God says, look, the more you give, and this isn't just giving financially. This might be just giving of your, one, of your own self. This might just be uh, being um, you know, hospitable to other people. The more you give, the more God will bless you. 
And when it comes to the concept of tithing, in Malachi 3.10, the Bible reads, Bring you all the tithes into the storehouse, that there may be meat in mine house, and prove me now herewith, saith the Lord of hosts, if I will not open you the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing, that there shall not be room enough to receive it. So God says, look, if you give generously of yourself, God's going to bless you so much that you can't even contain it. And you go, well, hold on, what does that mean? And I've heard a preaching that are against tithing say, well, hold on. If, if tithing is still applicable today in the New Testament, then why aren't we seeing all these rich Christians overflowing with wealth and riches? Because they're giving of the tithes, and yet God said in Malachi 3.10, if you do that, then God will pour you out a blessing that there should not be enough room enough to receive it. Okay, now, this is the problem, and, and I think this is, the, this is just the greed of man. This is just covetousness, okay? Because, and, and this is, again, the televangelists. You know, maybe we've been tainted by all these televangelists that are begging for money so they can get their own private jets instead of just flying you know, economy or business or first class, it's still so much cheaper than having to get their own jets and begging for their own jet and asking for people to give up their finances. And what they promise their viewers that if you give that thousand dollars or you give that amount, that God will give you riches beyond measure. And then people that are, I guess, good godly Christians read this kind of stuff and go, well, I've been giving my tithes for this many years. Why aren't I abandoning in wealth? Well, you know, when God blesses you, it's not always financially. Yes, it could be financially. It could be. Okay, God may give you a job that pays better. God may give you a pay rise. God may give you a bonus. All those things are true. I'm not saying that never happens. Okay, but you being blessed by God, God pouring out a blessing is more than money. I mean, when you think of people on their deathbed, okay, People on the deathbed and, and, and they say, oh, I wish I, I did this with my life. I wish I did that with my life. Are they saying, I wish I had more money? Are they saying, I wish I had more possessions? Are they saying, I wish I had more material wealth? No, what is it that they want? They wish they had spent more time with the family. Okay? You know, when older people see me and my wife just walking down with all our kids, you know what they often say? I wish I had more kids. You know, that's one area of my life that I kind of regret. I wish I could go back and, and have more children. And then you have the odd people that give you the odd look as well, you know. But, but generally speaking, that's what a lot of people say to us. You know, they're not saying, I wish I had more wealth. They say, I wish I had more kids, you know. And so when we think about how God can bless you, how, how things can overflow, you know, don't have this mindset that it must be because God's going to give me a, a paycheck a bigger paycheck, and that's how I expect God to bless me. No. You know, God can bless you financially in other ways that you might not even be aware of. You know, God may be um, holding your car together. You know, maybe it would have broken down by now and, and would have needed expensive service and repairs, and God's just holding back and keeping your, your material possessions from falling apart. I mean, that's one great way to save money, is not spending money. But generally speaking, those things you don't see. You don't see how God might be looking after your health so you don't have these high medical costs coming your way. Okay? So it's not just about, oh, I need to see this big paycheck. God may very well be sustaining your life, may very well be sustaining your material possessions from you having to spend more than you have. That's another way God can bless you, right? God may be blessing you with good Christian friends. That's another way that he might provide for you provide company, friendship, a family. You know, the fruit of the womb is his reward, the Bible says. Hey, it might just by giving you children, God is blessing you. So don't have this mindset that if I give my finances, God must give financially back. Well, look, first of all, the, the principle that we read here is that you can't outgive God. Whatever you give, God will give you more than that back, Okay. But don't, again, have the mindset that it's just money. No, God can give you... God has given us this church. I mean, how many... Before this church started, you know, how long have we been going now? Ten, ten months? 
You know, think about before you had this church, how much you wanted a church that was like-minded, how much you wanted a church that you didn't have to tiptoe around and, and make sure you didn't say the wrong thing. You know, how much you wanted a church that where people were happy to talk about the Bible and, and just have the same goals in life. How much you wanted a church that would be taking you out, getting you out soul winning and doing the work of God. You know, that's, that's another way God has blessed us, right? God has blessed us in, in many, many different ways. And of course, there's the eternal rewards that we tend to forget about. You know, who's to say that God's not laying up treasure for you right now in heaven when you give of yourself financially? You're going to prefer those rewards that are eternal than the temporary rewards that come in this life, okay? So just keep that, keep that in mind. You know, these verses aren't like, um, you know, they, they don't apply anymore. They do apply, okay? But you've got to think greater than just money. God has given you many, many blessings, really. You know, that, that hymn, we haven't sung it really, have we? Count your blessings. Name them one by one. If you sat there and you, you started to name all the blessings God has given you in life, boy, that'll bring you great joy. That'll bring you great humility to, um, to realize how much God has given us in our life. Okay? Now, the biggest problem that I have with the televangelists that's saying, look, give a thousand dollars. That's how God's going to bless you. Is that it's not about uh, quantity so much because quantity is relative. Okay, quantity is relative. You're in Luke 21, right? Luke 21, look at verse number one. Luke 21, verse one. This is speaking of Jesus. He says, And he looked up and saw the rich men casting their gifts into the treasury. Okay, and this doesn't impress Jesus. What impresses Jesus is the next verses. Verse number two. And he saw also a certain poor widow casting in thither two mites. So this certain poor widow gives much, much less compared to the rich men. Okay? And look what God, Jesus says in verse number three. And he said, of a truth I say unto you, that this poor widow have cast in more than they all. He said, but Kevin, no, she only gave two mites. How did she give more? Verse number four. For all these, the rich men, have of their abundance cast in unto the offerings of God, but she of her penury have cast in all the living that she had. So, you know, a few of you have said to me, you know, uh, Kevin, I, I can only give this amount. And, and I feel like you, you almost feel bad about it. Don't, why? You know, you're probably giving more than two mites, okay? And God knows what you're able to give. Okay, so what you're able to give is relative. I'm not going to stand here behind the pulpit and say, if God, God's going to bless you, God has a blessing right now, the anointing is here, if you want to receive it, hey, you need to, you know, sow $1,000 each. No, because you might only be able to give two mites, but it's given all that you have. And that's a greater price to God than the, than the rich man that can give $1,000, Okay. So, I mean, these tele-evangelists are so unbiblical. And could you expect, like, let's say this poor widow was watching Robert Tilly on TV and she couldn't give $1,000 and she could only give two mites. And how would she feel about herself? Oh, I must be, uh, you know, uh, I, I must be worthless to, in the sight of God. You know, that, I, that I, can't, I can't even give anywhere near that amount. And yet Jesus looks at her and goes, wow, you know, she gave of all she had. You know, God, obviously, this lady, I can't wait to see her in heaven. And she'll have one of the biggest mansions out there, right? She'll have, because she gave everything that she could give. She gave all that she had, all the living that she had. So, look, if you can only give a little bit, and you might be thinking, oh, we've got this building coming up, but I can't, I can't give that much, I can only give so much. Hey, gi giving is relative. Giving is relative to what you have. You know, there are times in my life where I've abounded much. I don't have a full-time work. I'm not abounding all that much these days. All right? So I can only give less. I can give less than what I could give when I was abounding. It doesn't matter. I'm giving of what I can, and, and God knows my heart. God knows uh, the condition of my heart and why I'm giving. Let's go back to 2 Corinthians chapter 9. 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 7. Um, let's see. Chris, Isabel, can you get me a serviette or a tissue or something? <coughs> 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 7. 
Point number three about giving is give with purpose. Give with purpose. Look at verse number seven. Every man according as he purposeth in his heart, so let him give. Not grudgingly or of necessity, for God loveth a cheerful giver. So he says, look, every man ought to purpose in his heart what he needs to give. And again, I've seen people that are against tithing use this verse and say, see, it's what you purpose in your heart. It's not given 10%, it's what you purpose. If you purpose 20%, if you purpose 2%, if you purpose 1%, it doesn't matter as long as you purpose it in your heart. But again, is the context of this tithing? No, the context of this is uh, giving a, a, a special offering, a special donation to a needy church, to a needy people. But again, we can apply these principles. You know, you ought to, and I do believe in tithing. I don't want to miss, you know, cause anybody to misunderstand that, is that I believe in order for you to tithe, you need to purpose that in your heart. You need to say that within yourself. Hey, I'm willing to give 10% of my income, and it's until you make that your purpose, that's when you're going to start giving it. If you don't purpose it in your heart, it's never going to happen. Okay? Now, <laughs> sorry guys. <laughs> now we already saw that God will outgive you. You say, well, I can't give 10%. God's going to outgive you. All right? Maybe not financially, but in, any, in other ways, God will bless your life. And uh, you need to give with purpose. You know, when I started to tithe, I was um, about 20 years old. Um, I was in, no, when we were, in, we were engaged when we were 20, right? We were 20 years old when we were engaged. We were saving up to get married. I wasn't working a full-time job. It took me a while. And then when I realized, oh, it's, we need to get married, I started to work, you know, find work and work a full-time job. I was working kind of part-time or casual work before that. And we hadn't saved up much. When, when I put my money together and Christina, put, we put our money together, we had about $5,000. And we had a, ma a wedding to pay for, right? Uh, by the way, our wedding pay was about $9,000. You know, we didn't spend any... I think Christina's dress was the most expensive thing. It was like $2,000 or something. Um, but we only had $5,000. And then I remember going to church and hearing about tithing for the first time. Like, I knew we need to give financially to the church, and we would do that. But I didn't realize there was this principle, this doctrine of tithing. And I was under, like, great conviction. I'm thinking, man, you know, we're trying to save up to get married. I've only got $5,000. You know, that's half of what we need for our wedding. And now you're telling me I need to give, what, $500? You know, 10% of what we've saved up? Because obviously I couldn't go back. I couldn't go back and work out exactly how much I've made and, and work out what 10% of that was. All I knew was this is how much we had saved up. God wants me to tithe. So, you know, my first tithe was about $500, you know, to the church. And then... Uh, and then weekly or whenever we got a paycheck, I would, I would just tie. You know, once I purposed it in my heart, you know, initially it was very hard. It was very hard to give that amount, especially because I'm trying to save up for my marriage, for my wedding, right? And, you know, we didn't have much. You know, obviously you need to pay for furniture and all that kind of stuff to, you know, pay rent. So you didn't, I wasn't paying rent before that or anything like that. Uh, but I, I had to make that purpose and say, you know what, God, I believe that you're going to outgive me I believe you're going to bless me. So, Lord, if you want my $500 to start with, then you're going to have to find a way to, for me to, you know, pay for my wedding. You know, you're going to have to, you know, give me a job that's paying me sufficient for me to uh, pay my rent and all this kind of stuff. I'm relying on you, Lord, to do this for me. And from that day till today, I still give my 10%. Now, I, I've said this before, but I think one of the big mistakes that... Uh, uh, preachers talk about when they tithe, when they, when they preach on tithing, is they say, if you don't tithe, that God will curse you, okay? And at this stage, I had that fear that if I didn't tithe, God would curse me. And I didn't want God's cursing upon my life because I'm trying to get married. I'm trying to save up, get married. I don't want to start my married life with this curse from God, you know? But eventually I figured out that, no, you know, in the New Testament, God does not curse us anymore. Yes, he can chastise us, okay? God has a different way of, of, uh, of, of punishing his people, and, and I'm blessed because I'm in Christ Jesus, you know? I'm perfect before God. I'm righteous before God. I'm blessed because I'm in Jesus. But still, I had, I had really purposed that in my heart, and I wasn't giving, like it says here, uh, grudgingly, but I was a cheerful giver. 
You know, I was giving it to the church. I knew that was the house of God. I knew that's where doctrine was being preached. I knew that's where, where um, you know, um, uh, soul winning was getting done and being sent from. So I already had purpose that in my heart and I was already giving cheerfully. And again, some people are against uh, tithing and they say, look, that second part, God love of a cheerful giver. Well, if you're expected to give 10%, then that's not you giving cheerfully. I don't really get that principle. Why? Why can't you give 10% of your income and give it cheerfully? You know, it's the condition of your heart. The reason why you don't give it cheerfully is because you've not applied this, this teaching. You know, at some points, you know, yes, it's hard to give your first 10%, but if you start giving of it, you know, it becomes part of your life and you know that it's going towards God's work. And just knowing that should drive you to give cheerfully. And if you're not giving cheerfully, there's probably something wrong with your spiritual state, you know? And again, please, I'm not preaching this because I need you to give necessarily more or I need, I need to start paying my, an income for myself. Really, I don't. It's just that this is what we're up to in, in the Bible reading, right? This is, you know, I, I'm going to stop apologizing, right? You know, this is just what the Word of God says and this is, this is what I'm preaching. Okay, so the, the third point that I wanted to make about giving is give with purpose, but the fourth point is what we just saw there is give, give cheerfully, you know, make sure that when you give to the, to the Lord, you don't give it out of a bad, you know, heart. You know, if, if the Lord is going to bless you, it's because he knows that you're giving in abundance with a cheerful heart, that you're giving to his work. Or in this case, a special offering, you're giving to a needful people that are God's people. Okay? Let's go to verse number 8. Verse number 8. And look at this. And God, this is a promise from God, and God is able to make all grace abound toward you, that ye ha are always having, look at this, that ye always have insufficiency in all things, may abound to every good work. It is impossible to outgive God, okay? You will always be provided for. You know, do you believe the scriptures? It says ye all, that ye always have in all sufficiency in all things. You know, if you want to be a person that has, that, um, you always have sufficient, you always have enough for your life, you always have enough for your family, you always have enough to pay your bills, okay, your necessities at least, you always want to be in that state, then give cheerfully. You know, give of yourself, give abundantly of yourself, give generously, because God is able to make His grace abound in you. Okay, that's the promise of the scriptures. Verse number nine. As it is written, he hath dispersed abroad, he hath given to the poor, his righteousness remaineth forever. Now, I'll be honest with you, verse number nine, I'm not sure if this is about the person that's given in the church. Maybe you guys have an answer for this. I'm not sure if it's referring to the, the he is referring to the person that, that's given to the church or that he is referring to God, God giving, like gi giving back, okay? Um, and now, when it says, as it is written, it's actually written in Psalm 112. So keep your finger there. Please turn to Psalm 112, Psalm 112, verse 7. Psalm 112, 112, verse 7. I want to get some context before. It's actually verse 9 that's being quoted. But let's start with verse number 7. It says here, He shall not be afraid of evil tidings. His heart is fixed, trusting in the Lord. And by the way, that's my point number 5. Give trusting the Lord. Trusting that the Lord will provide for your needs. Okay, verse number 8. There in Psalm 112, verse 8. His heart is established. He shall not be afraid until he see his desire upon his enemies. Verse 9. He hath dispersed, he hath given to the poor, his righteousness endureth forever, his horn shall be exalted with honour. Again, I'm not sure if this he is a reference to God or to the man that is trusting in God. Okay? But I think either way, you can apply this verse to both. You know, because it is talking about you giving, but the context is that God will give back to you and God will abound his grace in you, okay? So the fifth point I just wanted to bring out of this was to give trust in that the Lord will provide all your needs, okay? Back to 2 Corinthians chapter 9. 
2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse number 10. We're still in this bracket area, which started with verse number 9. Uh, verse number 10. He, uh, now he that ministereth seed to the sower, both minister bread for your food, and multiply your seed sown, and increase the fruits of your righteousness. Now this is, this is a, a reference that I do believe is referring to God. Because it's talking about a sower, it's talking about the farmer, right? The, the, the one that sows seed for, for grain, for wheat... He says, now he that ministereth seed to the sower. So who gives seed to the farmer? Who provides the seed to the farmer? It's God, isn't it? It's God that gives the seed to the farmer so that he can sow that seed. But it's, it's the same one that says, both minister bread for your food. Who's the one that gives you bread? Who's the one that gives you all your necessities? It is God. It is both God that gives the seed and it is God also that gives the bread, okay, that gives you uh, your, your food. And then it says, and multiply your seed sown. So the more you sow, God says, I'm going to multiply your seed that you can sow. I mean, that's weird, right? The more you give, God's going to give you the ability to give even more. And again, you don't need to apply this only to finances. You can apply this to other, all areas of your life. All areas that you need to sow in your life to reap uh, sufficiently. And then it goes, and increase the fruits of your righteousness. Increase the fruits of your righteousness. And you might say, you know, Kevin, I can't sow of my finances. I just don't have anything to sow. I don't even have two mites to sow. Well, first of all, it's God that gives you that seed. It's God that's given you those finances. You know, you shouldn't have a mindset these are my finances and I can't give of them. Well, hold on, no. The reason you have them is because they're God's finances. God has given them to you in the first place. And you go, no, no, hold on. I need the finances to buy my daily bread. Well, it's God that gives you your daily bread. It's God that provides all your needs. He gives you the finances and he gives you uh, the fruits that you need to, to get through life. Okay? So God is all around this. You know, God gives you so you can give, but then when you give, God makes sure that you're provided for. And so you can see how someone that gives all their finances to a church or gives to some special donation, that God is involved in that. God is stepping in and making sure that you're provided for. God is stepping in to, so you can be sure that you can even sow more abundantly in future. Kevin, you're sounding like a televangelist. <laughs> That's what the Bible says, right? The Bible says these things. Obviously, I'm not asking for $1,000 each, okay? You give as, as you can, as we saw that lady with the two mites, okay? Look at verse number 11. Verse number 11. Being enriched in everything to all bountifulness, which causeth, which, which causeth, causeth through us thanksgiving to God, okay? So God is the one who enriches you to give bountifully okay so you see where it says being enriched who enriches you god being enriched in everything to all bountifulness okay so god is the one that enriches you to give of your finances but then notice this it's not just a, a physical it's not just about money okay it's not just the physical he goes when you give of yourself he goes which causeth through us thanksgiving to God. The fact that you can give of yourself financially means that I can give thanks to God. Hey, it, it works his spirits. It edifies his heart. He's able to give thanks to God when other churches are able to give to the work of God. See, Paul himself did not need the finances, but seeing that you know, the church were doing this out of their, their hearts, were doing it cheerfully, he, as an apostle of God, was able to thank God, was able to do this spiritual work and praise, thank God, honor God for what others have been able to give. Okay? And when you guys give of your tithes and offerings, let me tell you now, I, I'm thankful to you, but I'm thankful to God knowing that He's providing for this church, that we can meet every week, we can have a roof over our heads, that we can share in food and fellowship, 
and we can afford our tracks, we can afford our, our, you know, the gifts that we give. You know, we can do all these things. And I thank God because I know ultimately it is God that's provided for us. Okay? So it's not just about money. It actually edifies your spirit. It edifies that new man to thank God. Look at verse number 12. For the administration of this service not only supplieth the wants of the saints, so it says, look, it doesn't just supply the wants, the physical needs of the saints, but is abundant also by many thanksgivings to God. Just again, reinforcing that fact that, you know, just giving financially causes others to thank the Lord. I don't know if you ever thought about that. Have you ever really thought about that? When I give financially, it causes others to thank the Lord, you know? I mean, again, think about just meeting here in this hall. The fact that, you know, the finances go to paying this hall, meaning that we can meet here, we can sing out loud, we can read the Bible, we have a place to fellowship. Don't you think that gives blessings to God? Don't you think that warms God's heart to know that New Life Baptist Church is, is pleasing Him, is fellowshipping, is edifying the believers, is singing praises to God? You know, and it starts by giving. It starts with the financial giving so we can have a place to meet and do the things that we do. Verse 13. <coughs> Verse 13. <coughs> All right. It says, While was by the experiments of this ministration, they glorify God for your, uh, for your professed subjection unto the gospel of Christ and for your liberal distribution unto them and unto all men. So now he's pointing to the believers in Judea that are going to benefit from the giving, right? He says, now remember, there's no Facebook, okay? There's no internet, there's no telephones, okay? The people in Judea, the Jews, the, the Jewish believers, are probably not even that aware of all the other churches that are throughout the world. Okay? They're probably not aware of all the brethren that are in the church. Yes, they hear reports from Paul. Yes, they hear reports from other men that have traveled in these other areas. But he goes, by the experiments, this is talking about the, I don't know how, it's an interesting word that uses experiment. I, I guess when you do an experiment, you're trying to find uh, evidence or proof of something. You're trying to come up with, you know, um, I don't know, uh, I don't know what the word I'm looking for exactly. Uh, but basically what he's saying is that the financial giving that was received by the saints in Jerusalem, uh, this has caused them to glorify God, yes, because their needs are met, but also it says that for your professed subjection unto the gospel of Christ. So these believers throughout the whole world that were uh, subjecting themselves to the gospel of Christ, that being they believed the gospel They were truly saved. This proved to the Judeans that there were other believers throughout the whole world, that they had received this financial gift, and they, for them, that was their proof. Wow, there are believers throughout the whole world. Remember, the Jews had a hard time with the Gentiles receiving the gospel, even Jews that were true believers in the churches. Okay, some of them were saying, hey, they need to get circumcised to be right with God, and all these kind of things. Well, when they saw the Gentile churches throughout the whole world giving of themselves financially for their needs, this proved to them that there were believers throughout the whole world, that there were believers that had subjected themselves to the gospel of Christ. You know, because they themselves were the ones that were sending these missionaries to begin with. And they could see the fruit of those works. They could say, wow, there really are believers out there. There really are brethren out there that love us, and now they're giving of themselves so that we can be, uh, you know, get through this um, uh, drought. You know? And he says, uh, And for your liberal distribution unto them and unto all men. The liberal, the generous distribution. This proved that they had brethren that loved them. Okay? So again, this is just proof of love. Again, if we ever need to take up a financial giving to a, to a church in need, to brethren in need, this is our way of showing that we love them. Okay? Verse number 14. And by their prayer for you, which long after you, for the exceeding grace of God in you. 
So Paul's saying, look, when you give, you're going to have these brethren that are benefiting from your giving. They're going to be remembering you in prayer. They're going to bring you before God. And obviously God's going to hear their prayers. And you know, the more people you have praying for you, the more God's going to be able to answer the prayers and, and make your ways easy, make your ways right, provide for all your needs. And so there was this benefit even to the uh, Corinthian church. It wasn't just we're giving and that's it. No, they're getting a blessing in return, not just by God, but by the prayers of those that are receiving uh, um, the donation that they put together. And verse 15, Thanks be unto God for his unspeakable gift. Now, I'm not sure what that unspeakable gift, you might say, well, that must be Jesus Christ, potentially. But I think just in the context of this, it's just that um, thanks be to God for this unspeakable gift, the gift that was given by, by the giver and received by the receiver, the, the gift of that donation. He's given thanks to God, you know. And, you know, we need to thank God. We need to, we're running 10, we're 10 months in, guys. Everything that we've needed to pay has been paid for. You know, we're slowly reimbursing my costs, personal costs. That's starting to be taken care of. You know, God has provided, and it's not a lot of us, but God has provided for our every need, our every step. You know, we need to be mindful and thank God that we have uh, working people, that we have people that can give of themselves financially. And I'm, I'm very thankful for what you've been able to give, just personally, you know, and I thank God for what you've been able to give. So just keep that in mind, guys. That's, that's the teaching from this chapter. Yes, we know we ought to give, but make sure that we give out of a generous heart. We give out of a cheerful heart. We don't give grudgingly. You know, um, we, we um, give trusting, knowing that the Lord will give back in return. And again, be mindful. Hey, it's not always God giving you money. Yes, he could do that, but he, he gives us in many other ways that we probably won't even know until we're in heaven and we can finally, you know, look back at our lives and see how God, you know, worked in, in our lives in, in many different ways. Okay, let's pray.